Good evening, guests. A very warm welcome to the Körper Forum. I said it before, we are pleased to see so many faces. Some of you have come here so soon that you realized that there was a fire alarm that went off and you had to wait outside and freeze. So thank you so much for your patience. That's also the reason why we have a small delay. I'm pleased to see you. I'm pleased to be able to welcome you here. Also, the people connected online. My name is Alisa Vogt. I work at the Körper Foundation in Berlin, and I work within international politics. Tonight, we would like to talk about foreign policy. Well, actually, feminist foreign policy. This is a series in which we try to explain political terms, terms that might not be as known or terms that have not yet been fully explained. We would like to do a deep dive. We would like to enlarge upon different political perspectives. Some of you might remember that we invited Nina Poppel to come here in May of last year to talk about the Seitenwende. Today, we would like to talk about feminist foreign policy. Our foreign minister, Nina Baerbock, announced this policy in 2021. And with the ongoing developments in Iran, this subject is being discussed. We have our own publication, the Berlin Pulse, which is a representative survey that we conduct regularly. And we did that on the issue of German foreign policy. We wanted to know what is feminist foreign policy. Now I would like to know from you what you know. Well, actually, I don't. I know that you know that this is a term because this is why you came here. But who of you would say, well, yes, I have heard of the term before, but I don't know what it means. Maybe you could raise your hands. Okay. That's maybe more than a third of the audience. Who would say, well, I know approximately what it means. Okay. That's the second, third. And who would say, I know exactly what it means. Wonderful. I've seen some hands going up, wonderful. So we will ask you towards the end of the panel discussion if there is anything that you would like to add. I believe you know more than the people that we interviewed. 46% told us that they had never heard of this term before and only 12% knew what it meant. Excuse me? That was a survey conducted in the fall of last year. So we are very pleased to be able to discuss feminist foreign policy tonight. We would like to take a closer look. What does it mean? What are its central aspects? What can it achieve in these times of crises and wars? What does it mean for the future foreign and security policy, and what does it mean for all of us? But before we start, I would like to ask you and those who have been here last year know what this is all about. I would like you to help us find out what it means. Please take out your mobile phones, go to menti.com, and give us your associations to the term of feminist foreign policy. And then we can create a word cloud. The code is seen on the screen. and. The terms that you are entering will be shown on the screen. And the more a term is mentioned, the bigger it will appear on the screen. So we try to collect different subjects. And we could maybe come back to them later. Now, you are at the Kerber Foundation, and I would like to explain to you why we do series like these. Kurt Kerber founded the foundation in 1961. He actually established the Bergedorf Discussion Group. It was established to serve as a platform for dialogue between the East and the West in times of the Cold War. Well, many things have changed since then. 
and various formats have been added to the portfolio of the Kerber Foundation, but we always have the same goal. We would like to promote exchange, we would like to enter into dialogue, and to that end, we have invited and we are inviting panelists to discuss different topics with us. And this is what we would like to do today. Mr. Annan, Ms. Spart, it's great to have you here. Thank you so much for following our invitation. Nina Popper will introduce you in greater detail later on. And now, Nina, I'm pleased to introduce you to the audience. Nina Popper, some of you know her. Since 2020, she's had her own Instagram account where she uploads small videos where she explains different political concepts in a very simple and factual manner. And we will show you one of those videos in short. Nina holds a master's degree in empirical political and social research from the University of Stuttgart. And she's very active on social media, but she also works at the Southwest German Broadcasting Corporation, SWR. So, Without any further ado, I would like to thank you again. Please come onto our stage. The word is yours, Nina. And now I would like to show you a video. Let's talk about feminist foreign policy. Tell me, Nina, what is it about feminism? Why does the federal government really have to make such a fuss about it? What do you mean? Well, our foreign minister is pursuing a feminist foreign policy. Yes. Well, in feminism means that you hate men, or in nicer terms, women wanting to trouble men or something like that. This has nothing to do with feminism, and especially not with the way I see it. So what does feminism mean to you? Think of intersectional feminism. It's not just about equality between men and women. It's about equal opportunities for all. It incorporates all disadvantaged groups, so people who are discriminated against on the basis of their disability or skin color. And what does feminist foreign policy entail? Well, it depends on whom you ask. Well, I'm asking you. Well, it depends on whether you ask those with a pragmatic approach, one of them being the German federal government, or those from the activist faction. So please start with the activist faction. First of all, both factions think of feminist foreign policy as a policy where human security takes center stage and not state security. It's not just about two countries waging war, but about the protection against other threats like poverty, diseases, and natural disasters. It's about acknowledging that people have different security needs. Feminist foreign policy wants to remove power structures within a society and foreign policy so that everyone feels safe, independent of their age, sex, or skin color. Let me give you an example. A middle-aged male academic in Germany has completely different security needs and problems than a single mom in Bangladesh. Oh. That was a rather long explanation. Let me now come to the activist faction, since you were asking for that too. The activist faction's ambition is to completely change the structures of societies and of international cooperation with the aim to making the world violence free. That is why they focus a lot on topics like disarmament, nuclear armament, and military deterrence. By the way, this faction is critical of arms deliveries. But the German government did send weapons to Ukraine. Correct. And this is why I think the German government is part of the pragmatic group. It thinks delivering weapons for purposes of self-defense is acceptable, but it never explained the hows and whys. So are there any countries that are already pursuing a feminist foreign policy? Well, the international framework for it was created by different UN resolutions stipulating that the single country should introduce action plans. And this resulted in the first feminist foreign policy program of the world, namely in Sweden in 2014. Sweden has really pushed feminist foreign policy and has acted as a role model for the German policy. But Sweden had general elections last year where they voted down Sweden's feminist foreign policy in favor of a right-wing conservative government, which is currently in power. Yes, but countries like France, Spain, Luxembourg, Mexico, and Canada have committed themselves to pursuing feminist foreign policy programs. So it's more about the security of people. The summit is a good thing, but difficult in real life. So what do feminist foreign policies want to achieve? Can you tell me in one sentence? Well, it is a concept of security and foreign policy, which includes and regards the safety needs of all people. 
But besides foreign policy, there are other fields like healthcare policy, climate policy, and development assistance that are considered. Well, all that sounds quite reasonable, but why is there so much criticism? So with that said, a very warm welcome from me to you. I would also like to welcome everyone who are connected online. Well, this is what I do. This is my profession. I talk to and with myself. I discuss topics pertaining to the realm of feminism. And this is what I do at the Broadcasting Corporation, and I love it. It's great that we have jobs like these. I didn't explain the entire concept, which isn't a problem, because this is why we are here. We want to discuss it. So what's the good thing, what's the bad thing of feminism and feminist foreign policy? We have invited three exceptional guests, Helga Barth and Kama Ekmekci. And I believe this will be a great discussion. We had a fire alarm, so I believe since we started 10 minutes later, we will also extend the debate by 10 more minutes. Okay, I would like to give you some logistical remarks. We have a live stream, and there's an audience behind the live stream. And you can all ask questions, but you have to go to menti.com. But I don't have the code, I must confess. Where is the code? It's 8696-5121. But you can see the code by a live stream. And how can you ask questions, the audience here? You can do that after 8 o'clock. And now we can start. Let's start the discussion. In 2021, Alina Baerbock became our foreign minister. And with that, the topic of feminist foreign policy reached our agenda. And it's great to have Helga Barth with us today. She works at the German F Foreign Ministry. A very warm welcome to you. Since August of 2019, she's been the Commissioner for Human Rights and Global Health at the Federal Foreign Office. And from 2015 to 2019, she was the envoy and head of the political section at the German Embassy in Washington, D.C. Before that, she was the head of division at the Federal Chancellery for Asia, the Near and Middle East, Africa, and Latin America. But she held previous positions. She was a research coordinator on the planning staff. She was a political officer at the embassies of in Ankara and Tokyo. And she was deputy consul general at the consulate general Canton in the People's Republic of China. Wow, what an impressive career. So, Ms. Bart, let's start with you. You are an experienced diplomat. So how long have you been involved in this debate on a feminist foreign policy? Well, I started dealing with the topic even before the current term, because this did not start with Annalena Baerbock. It started with the coalition agreement. We have the term, the title, let's talk about feminist foreign policy. Well, it means we want to do something for a feminist foreign policy. So this is a task for the German federal office. But this has been around for many more years. Three and a half years ago, I started to work with the Action Alliance 2325, and this is an alliance where women come together, mostly women, to represent a raft of different civil institutions and the civil society. And they had asked us over and over again, when will you put this topic, feminist foreign policy, on the agenda? When will you pursue a different ambition within foreign policy? And we had discussed whether or not this label was needed in a coalition to be able to tap into more resources, to have more people, more money. Or does this label actually harm the ambition with our federal minister talking to other countries which 
do not have any feminist foreign policies at all. They don't even have gender equality. So maybe this label is disadvantageous for our ambition. So this is something that we have talked about for many, many years. Now, in your videos, you talked to yourself. We do similar things. So good. Makes me sound less awkward. In the video, I also talked about those different structures within feminist foreign policy and that there are different interpretation approaches. Ms. Bat, I saw you nodding. You nodded when I said that the current government is part of the pragmatic group. Can you give us a little more input? It pursues a pragmatic approach, but we want to shed light on this feminist reflex. We want people to think about feminism and with all the funds that we spend, the money that we have, we need to acknowledge that intersectionality plays a role. It's not just men and women. It's also a traditional thought within humanitarian aid. Ever since a CSU minister took office in the Federal Ministry of Development, we talked about these different needs. And we also see that different political crises impact people differently. Iran, Afghanistan, and when we say this is a pragmatic approach, we acknowledge that we need to strike a balance. There is no panacea to everything. A feminist foreign policy means that we cannot solve all problems. It's the same for a non-feminist foreign policy. But we approach things differently. We think about it differently. And what is important to us in the German Federal Ministry, in the Federal Foreign Office, we want to embrace a cultural change. We want to find new guidelines, but it should be pragmatic. We will not be able to recruit female diplomats all over the world or in 50% of all embassies, but we need to acknowledge that we have goals that we are working towards. And we need to convince us, we need to convince colleagues to work in that direction. Could you tell us what 3R plus D means? Well, it sounds like a magic equation. It means representation, rights, and resources. Women's rights is not something that ranks high on the agenda. The Convention on the Abolishment of Discrimination Against Women has been ratified by many countries, but of course women are still being discriminated against. There are still marginalized groups that are being discriminated against. So where do women appear in politics? We need to think about that. Oftentimes, I'm the only woman in a room full of men. And I believe now we have sharpened our view. When German politicians travel, they come with their entourage of men. And I'm wondering, is this a good representation of our society? An American colleague once said that there were more colleagues with the name of Thomas than women around the same table. And I believe we have all been in situations like these. S Mr. State Secretary, if I may say that, our German government isn't a government with a high representation of women, 34%, give or take, I believe it's 31%. I believe it has gone down. It was 34%. Now it's 31%. Das, das ist, ich yes, so you cannot really break it down to that level. 
the situation is changing and the Federal Foreign Office is now also a reflection of our society. This is our objective. One last question to you. How does feminist foreign policy look like very specifically in your everyday work? Well, the third R is very important, resources. So you can do a lot if you think about where do we spend money? Project funds, subsidies. This is something that we do in the Federal Foreign Office, humanitarian aid, human rights uh, projects. So we have to ask ourselves which objectives do we want to achieve and which groups do we want to um, support and we have high objectives, 85% of the resources from the Federal Foreign Office should be spent on gender sensitive and 8% on gender transformation. Gender transformation, that sounds revolutionary, but gender transformation happens in many different areas with human rights projects. We are funding many human rights projects in order to motivate other countries to do without um, the the capital punishment. And this is something that we also have as an objective in feminist foreign policy. Thank you so much. With that, I would like to welcome our second guest, Nils Annen. It's actually his home, but he said it's not his electorate um, because he comes from Hamburg, Eimsbüttel, a different um, district, so this is his constituency. He is a member of the SPD, the Socialist Party, Party and since 2005, with one interruption, he has been a member of the German Bundestag, the federal parliament, and he has always been active in foreign policy. Initially, as foreign policy spokesman for the SPD parliamentary group, and from 2018 to 2021, he was Minister of State at the Federal Foreign Office. Since 2021, he has been parliamentary state secretary to the Federal Minister for Economic Cooperation and Development. Mr. Annen, welcome. Yes, a round of applause. Mr. Annen, on the occasion of the 150th anniversary of the Federal Foreign Office, you called for feminism instead of patriarchy. You have also sat on discussion panels on feminist issues in the past. So I would like to know about your motivation. I like it very much. <laughs> Thank you. Good evening and thank you for the invitation. Well, indeed, that was a speech I gave and I only got to know that I was supposed to give that speech just a few hours before giving the speech and Heiko Maas was actually supposed to give the speech speech and I can just tell you as a minister or state secretary you actually are given a text, a manuscript and people have been working on that for hours and I like that speech very much and I didn't want to correct anything or change a lot and the speech also included points on equal rights and that the Federal Foreign Office is dealing with the question how to fulfill the demand or the claim in, what's in one's own policies. However, I th thought that, that, that it has to be clearer. I thought that we should come up with a more specific wording. So my team and me, we worked on the text and I presented that speech and I got so much feedback. I was quite surprised about the amount of feedback on this sentence. I was very happy about it, but looking back, also looking back at the time in the Federal Foreign Office, also under Minister Maas, I have to say that we did a lot internally. We promoted women in the Federal Foreign Office, but also outside the Foreign Office. On the Security Council, we wanted to promote um, feminist foreign policy, although we haven't really defined the term yet. So that was very good. And looking back, I'm actually quite shocked that there are so many men 
in the Federal Foreign Office. And they actually use all the means and tools available in order to fight for their privileges. And this is still the case. <coughs> there is some internal magazine from the Federal Foreign Office. I'm not reading it all the time any longer, but there was a lot of feedback and I was quite shocked and surprised. However, in the leadership team of the Federal Foreign Office, we were, of course, shocked, but we were also motivated by that. We said we have to change that. So. In the Federal Foreign Office, it is true that this is actually the house or the body that represents Germany to the outside world. Of course, we have the Federal Chancellor, we have the ministers who are traveling. However, it is the job of the Federal Foreign Office to represent its country. And if the Federal Foreign Office is not really representative of that country, something is wrong. So we cannot accept that situation. So we are currently working on that and the current government is doing it right now with even a stronger focus with all the respect for my colleagues back then. Thank you. Ms. Bart already said that feminist foreign policy does not only apply to the Federal Foreign Office, and I already mentioned that you are currently State Secretary at the Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development. How and to what extent are the agenda, goals and measures of feminist foreign policy also adopted in other policy areas and ministries? Well, I think we have a very good starting point in the current government. We have our Foreign Minister, Annalena Baerbock, and she is very committed to feminist foreign policy. And there's also a nice story why we use the English term. I don't know whether I'm allowed to tell you, but the colleagues from the FDP, the Liberal Party, they didn't want to use the German term feministisch. That is why we use the English term feminist foreign policy. And my minister, Svenja Schulze, after taking over her mandate and her office, she also said for the Ministry of Economic Cooperation and Development that we also want to define our feminist policy. So we have those two ministries focusing on that. So this is already a clear signal and we also coordinate with one another. And it's true we have a pragmatic policy, but you also showed it quite nicely in your video clip. The activist approach also wants to change generous structures, and this is also what I want. I don't think that we can change all the unjust structures worldwide with our development policies. We also have to get a feeling how limited our tools and means are. However, we really focus on feminist foreign policy, be it in the fight of poverty and hunger and malnourishment. And we always see a structural inequality and injustice, injustice hindering development. And more than 50% of the world population, women and girls, are not really represented in the group of decision makers. So this is a critical question that we are raising. We're not revolutionaries, but we are asking the general questions. And does it work everywhere? What else does cooperation with other institutions and the Bundestag, the parliament, look like? Well, colleagues from the German Bundestag, from the parliament, established a working group. This is a group of members of parliament, and I don't know whether men are included in the group, I hope so. And they established this group in order to promote feminist foreign policy. And I can just tell you what we do in our ministry, we support the policy of Ms. Schulz. It's one thing to discuss it, but in economic cooperation and development, we also rely on resources. Together with our partners, we have to implement projects and they have to be funded. And for that, we need the German parliament. 
and I have the impression that within the coalition, people support this topic, but I can, I can also see it outside of my ministry. So it's not that controversial and we don't see too many confrontations. Of course, now my colleagues are sometimes being criticized because they don't use the term feminist cooperation and development policy. However, I think the focus is clear. We want to ensure justice and everything is on board and I think that's important. In many countries, also in Europe, we realize that conservative parties are moving to the right ring and they are against funding development. The CDU, the Christian Democratic Union and my friend Paul Simiak gave a speech in front of the budget committee and they, he said that we spent not enough money on development policy. I can live with that. Of course, he's not always right, but I think it's the good sign. Despite different parties, we are cooperating with one another. And this is also true for the left-wing party. And the parliamentary group, which actually reduced the women's share, which is the right-wing party, the AFD, is alone. That's exciting. It sounds too good to be true. It sounds as if everyone is a feminist and promoting feminist foreign policy. But what I want to discuss with you is the public opinion. In this room, 30% or 33% said, I don't really know what you're talking about. Another 33% said, okay, we know a little bit what you're talking about. And I can tell you a little story. I was traveling with Annalena Baerbock and they were working on the security strategy and we had interviews with citizens on the street and I was able to interview many citizens. And there was always a different foreign and security policy and in Munich we talked about feminist foreign policy. And we talked about it everywhere, but especially in Munich and many people were very critical, especially women. Women also said, well, we shouldn't get any privileges as women. So I would be interested in what you think. You are a member of parliament, you meet different people, and maybe all the people don't have the knowledge in foreign policy. How does feminist foreign policy resonate with people in your constituency? Well, I cannot speak on behalf of all the people. But I think that this concept is being supported by a broad majority. Maybe not at first glance, not when you take a look at the first reaction, so you have to be careful. We are living in times of cultural wars. There are debates about wars. There are polarized uh, debates. And if we talk about poverty and wars, So, there's always the risk to also include these developments, feminist foreign policy, for instance, in these internal debates that we are sucked into these new structures. But I also try to explain that it is about a general human rights question we're talking about. However, there are also individuals who consider this term feminism to be the wrong term. It has different associations among people. Sometimes it sounds provocative to people. And sometimes you also need the trigger to continue the discussion. Sometimes you need an incentive to continue the discussion. So maybe people don't like using the term, but they like the general idea. And for me, that's okay. So you always have to reflect. There's always the risk that you are discussing terms and you are not discussing the content. We have to avoid such a situation. But at which points would more exchange and explanations or even clarification be necessary? Well, there is one misunderstanding that this is a policy which is only about women. This is something that men ask themselves. 
The Federal Foreign Minister and the Minister for Economic Cooperation and Development are talking about it. And then the Federal Chancellor identifies himself with feminists. So it might be the case that there are men in this country who think it is not about them. However, this is a big misunderstanding. I would just stick to my sphere. The obstacles to human development affect all of us. We have seen that during the pandemic. We are only safe and secure when everyone's safe. This is the insight from the pandemic and it goes a step further. This is true for global health. And what I think is very drastic, this is also true for fighting hunger and poverty. If we cannot fight hunger and poverty, this will result in political instability. And political instability means that states will become more fragile. They cannot care for their people. There is no um, support for the people and there is a safe haven for terrorists. And I think you can explain this. So when we talk about feminine, feminist foreign policy, we talk about all of us. It's about all of us. But we have to do what we talked about at the beginning. We have to include it in our own policies, in our own ministries. We have to make sure that we are also a role model, that we are convinced about that. And we cannot do that if there are only men sitting at the table. So this won't happen without conflicts. And this is something which I also learned myself in the Federal Foreign Office. Thank you so much. And now it is very good that we can also think outside the box and also discuss feminist foreign policy in the international context. For this, I would like to welcome Kama Egmechi, our third speaker. First, I would like to introduce her. She is a consultant at UN Women, the United Nations Gender Equality Organization. And she is senior policy fellow at the Isom Fairs Institute of the American University of Beirut. Previously, she was foreign policy advisor to Lebanese Prime Minister Saad Hariri, and she held various positions at the United Nations. Her interest is in the role of women in diplomacy and peace building and mediation, and this motivated her to found the hashtag DiploWomen initiative. She wants to share knowledge, she wants to present opportunities for mentoring and she wants to strengthen networks and since 2021 she has been hosting the podcast the diplo women here she regularly interviews strong women's voices from the middle east and things allowed with them about what role the feminist perspective has or should have in foreign and security policy issues welcome Don't be surprised, I will ask in German, but she will answer in English. I hope that you all have headphones if you need the translation. Ms. Ekmekci, why did you start Hashtag Diplo Women back then and what exactly is your podcast about? Sure. Um, first of all, uh, I'll speak slowly for the translation. Allow me to begin by thanking the Kerber Stiftung for having me here in Hamburg today with this uh, distinguished panel. It feels good to be in a country that is having this debate. I come from Lebanon, where our currency has collapsed, our city was blown to pieces by the Beirut port explosion. We are in a deep economic, social, political, institutional crisis. Our debates are very primitive. So it's a breath of fresh air to be here and uh, to have this debate here about the feminist foreign policy, I envy you. I hope you don't take this for granted. So, uh, I started the, the, the DiploWoman hashtag a few years ago uh, because, like yourself, Your Excellency, I felt that I was in a room full of men all the time. And I thought that this was something that's not natural. It's not normal to be in a room uh, full of men all the time in a political setting. So, I decided to embark on a mission to try to raise awareness 
uh, amongst the youth, but also amongst all uh, ages, uh, about the importance of the role of women in negotiations, political negotiations, mediation, conflict resolution, uh, 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 working in politics, whether it's local politics, regional politics, uh, uh, municipalities, etc., or at the high, high level. So this is why I started uh, this hashtag. It started to grow mainly on Instagram, uh, and it became a podcast with the support of uh, UN Women and the Aysan Faris Institute, where I'm a, I'm a fellow. And uh, it, it, it really uh, became a, sort of a place where people can connect and have this discussion in mainly in my part of the world, in the Middle East, um, or what now we call West Asia and North Africa, because middle is relative to who? It's such a colonial term. We're talking about feminist foreign policy. We should redefine also <laughs> where we are, middle relative, in relative to who? So, uh, so this is how, uh, basically, in a nutshell, it started, the idea of diploma. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Not on English. Thank you. Now, you are a mediation advisor. What role can women play in conflict mediation and what role should they play? Um, I will answer the, the, the question on mediation and, and the role of the importance of having women mediators. Uh, but first, I really, if you can allow me a few minutes to talk about the feminist foreign policy of uh, Germany and other countries, because I sit in the receiving end of that policy. So you have all these capitals sitting and strategizing about their foreign policies. Someone's being affected by that foreign policy. And it's, it's countries like, uh, like ours. So just to, to quickly, and this is going to affect uh, my answer about the mediation. When my understanding of a feminist foreign policy is that it's a new political framework it's a political framework. It's centered around the well-being of all marginalized groups, so not only women, but all more marginalized groups. It gives us an opportunity to step outside this black box approach of traditional foreign policy that's always thinking about military force, violence, domination, and offering an alternative inter intersectional rethinking of security. So what's foreign policy? It's, policy? it's politics and it's security. So my question to all these nations that are developing their, developing their, their foreign policy, their feminist foreign policy, are you also ready to have a feminist politics and a feminist security, because these are the, the, the same lens if we don't look at politics and security through the same intersectional feminist lens, then feminist foreign policy will be a little bit of blah, blah, blah from where I'm sitting. And the reason why I wanted to mention this is because in countries like ours, in my region, which is the highest level uh, of conflicts in the world, right? We, I mean, now Europe, you know, you're also trying to compete, unfortunately, with us, with your conflicts. But we have remained since 2000, until 2019, as the most volatile region in the world with conflicts in Syria, Yemen, Libya, Iraq, Israel, Palestine. So we have a lot of conflicts in our region. And for 70, 80 years, Men have governed our region. So if I take a step back and look at my region and everything that's going wrong, I say, well, uh, this is happening because these you know, old men are sitting in a room and making decisions about our countries. So I'm, I'm saying we need to have a different approach. And here comes the role of women in resolving conflicts, right? We have been looked at as, and all the research shows that women uh, and girls carry the brunt of conflict, right? So we've always been looked at as the victims. What I need us to think together today is how we can move women from being just the victims to also the decision makers. Because to help those victims, somebody needs to understand these victims. If we are the victims, then we also need to be the ones helping those victims coming out of, how can I trust a group of men 
to help the majority of the victims that are women. We need women at the table to be able to understand how to help these marginalized groups and these vulnerable groups. And when you, countries like Sweden, Germany, Canada, France, have feminist foreign policies, then you sort of, in your rhetoric, in your narrative with our governments, you will start saying, where are the women at your table? Why are they not present? Why are they not mediating conflicts? Why are they not in the negotiation table? We don't see them. We think that they should be present there, because otherwise we will not be able to fund that bridge that you have. We will not be able to offer that big aid package that you asked us for. I know it's easier said than done. And, you know, I was in politics. I see uh, uh, Nina in her video said you have the civil society activists group who are perfectionists or purists, and you have the government who is practical. Well, that's exactly the job of the activists. That's exactly the job of civil society. They need to be purists. They need to be perfectionists. They need to be utopic. And that's the job of the government. They need to be practical. And they need to find practical solutions to these complex problems. But unless we have that voice on your heads, constantly saying, you know, you need to try better, you need to try better, things will not advance. So this is, I mean, in a nutshell, why I wanted to connect the two. Thank you so much. You did my work. You did my job. Ms. Bart, I saw you taking notes. Do you want to chime in? Do you want to say anything? Or do you want me to proceed? Oh, yeah, thank you so much. I did take notes. Of course. What you were describing... Oh, a microphone. What you were describing... is the civil society or groups of civil society asking things of the government. This is a changing political approach. You mentioned the bridge. In the end, this bridge needs to be built after all. But what I heard from our foreign minister is the following, and she's the first female foreign officer, foreign minister, I'm sorry, and there are so many women working in her ministry, the press secretary, consultants, and each and every partner needs to try to follow suit, be it the American counterpart, the Japanese counterpart, the constant question as to where are the women? When we talk about negotiations, peace negotiations, whenever peace negotiations involve, include women, then these negotiations yield better and more long-standing results. But still, this is only the minority of peace negotiation that we have seen. Ms. Igmekci. Now, we talked about feminist foreign policy not just being about women, but could you tell us why women need to be acknowledged specifically after all? Yes. Sorry, I will remove this because I don't want to hear the translation. Um, well, of course, I mean, there is this uh, question that I always get, you know, why should women be acknowledged? Well, there is the very simple mathematical formula that it's 50% of the population. I think we can stop the argument there. Uh, but for those who are not convinced by this simple answer, uh, there is also evidential uh, uh, arguments. And uh, you, you mentioned one of them. There has been extensive research, extensive research that has been done for the past three decades that has shown, you know, evidentially shown that when women are included in the decision-making process, then the peace that is attained, the agreements that are attained, are more sustainable. 
Uh, there was a study done by UN Women, the global study on the women peace and security agenda. It showed that all the uh, uh, civil uh, wars uh, between 2003 uh, 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 and 2010 that relapsed were because the agreements that were made did not include women. So there was a high rate of relapsing into conflict you know, because of one of the reasons being that, again, I want to here stress the point, many factors come into play, right? I don't, I'm not saying women are the magic formula, the minute you put them in the mix, everything is going to be better, right? I'm not having that, uh, uh, you know, delusional idea. But what I'm saying is, is just common sense. And my dream is to retire from this job and to stop talking about it, because I shouldn't be talking about it. But the reality is we're far from it. Not only in Europe, I see, <laughs> because we always look at you as more advanced when it comes to gender equality, but especially in my region. And so really, I feel like there's a lot of work to be done uh, uh, together. We need to do this work together. Uh, because like I said, we're at the receiving end of the foreign policy. My only wish is that this new approach to foreign policy does not become another occasion for double standards. Because we have seen a lot of double standards in foreign policy from different countries. I'm not, mention, I'm not talking here about Germany. Generally speaking, uh, I, I hope that this will not be another occasion for more double standards. In fact, this is an opportunity to correct that kind of double standards in foreign policy. I have one last question. I have one last question. I actually said that question or asked that question before. In the German government, we have a women representation of 31%, which is one third. Now, as to the representation of women in conflict solution, how many women are involved? Uh, in the history of, uh, of uh, negotiators, uh, actually, we've only had uh, two women who have signed peace agreements in history. Uh, we've had only 6% of negotiators, 8% of mediators. This is a very, very low number. And uh, 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 although I don't want to get into that, you need to do another video about Security Council Resolution 1325, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> but uh, 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 there was 20, uh, 23 years ago, in the year 2000, the Security Council uh, at the United Nations unanimously passed a resolution for the first time in history called Re Security Council Resolution 1325. And for the first time, it was a landmark resolution that called for countries to in include more women in their peace and security in high-level decision-making uh, positions. And so since then, you know, there has been 10 subsequent resolutions. So that the legal framework for that is there, right? We have a legal international framework that calls for this, but yet the numbers are low. And I have a theory for this, if I have a minute to, to say why the numbers are still low, low 20 years later. I think the numbers are low because for the last 20 years, everybody has been working on the supply side of the equation. Where are the women? Let's build capacity. Let's train. Let's throw money on uh, training uh, women in different countries on public speaking, leadership, uh, this, that, and the other. So now we have a great number of women who are ready to lead. What's missing is the demand side of the equation. Nobody is calling for them to lead. And so here, the role of you, Nina, and people like you come into play to democratize the women, peace, and security agenda, to democratize feminist foreign policy. Because for the past 20 so years, it has been an elitist topic. How many have you even heard of this women, peace, and security agenda? Uh, but how can you call for it if you don't know what it is? My problem is that it's been an elitist topic. 
very elitist. Governments talk about it. Uh, they sit on debate tables and discuss it. Academics who write beautiful papers, unfortunately not many people are reading these days because <laughs> our concentration span is limited to 240 characters, i.e. a tweet. So it's very hard for, for, for us to have this discussion openly in a, dem in a democratized mainstream way. So people like you who are trying to make this more accessible to the public have a great role to play. And these are the sort of alliances that we need to build to advance the role of women in, 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 in political representation, in conflict resolution, in mediation and negotiation. Vielen Dank. Da würde ich, ja. Thank you so much. I would like to follow up on that. It's the topic of communication. I liked your story very much, Mr. Annen, that the FDP doesn't want to use the German term and just translated it into English. But I just want to ask the three of you, isn't it the wrong term, feminist foreign policy? Should it maybe be called inclusive? foreign policy or should it be humanist foreign policy so is it the right term or the wrong term i think it's the right term you can see it in this room we are fully booked tonight uh, everyone's an interested in that topic and I'm very happy about it and you can see that the term feminist development corporation um, is also being discussed quite often. So some like the term, others don't like the term, but I don't think that we need to discuss the term. We need to discuss the content. There was uh, applause, a little bit of applause. <laughs> Ms. Bart, what do you think? It's the right term. I was also talking to myself for hours and I came to that conclusion, it is the right term. And it's also an opportunity that it is controversial. Mr. Annen already said, many people are here in this room, we could have called it differently and maybe not that many people would have been attracted. We have to explain the term, we have to explain what we're doing and you have to take away fears of people. And in foreign policy it's also important to say what we specifically do. What does it mean at the end of the day? What does it mean beyond that label? So. Personally, I love the term. I don't think we need to change one letter in the term. Practically <laughs> speaking, I mean, I, I don't know if you can go into uh, a, a country, uh, a cert certain countries, and say that term and feel like you can operate normally with the leadership there. Uh, and this is, a pra again, to go back to the practical issues, you know, I mean, is the word feminist foreign policy for countries who are adopting it for domestic consumption or for international consumption? Because if it's for domestic consumption, it may work well, but if you are addressing some countries in my part of the world, they will question you uh, and wonder you know, I mean, we in Lebanon, for instance, I give you a, a, a simple example. It's a bit complicated, bear with me. So everything is complicated in my country. So uh, here you talk about equality, gender equality, equality amongst genders. In my country, two women are not equal because we don't have a civil personal status law meaning we have 15 different confessions, so sectarian groups, and every confession has a different law deciding birth, death, inheritance, divorce, uh, uh, child custody, etc. So me and my fellow woman from another sect are not equal, right? So imagine for, uh, like a country like mine where the political parties cannot agree to have one law 
that governs our day-to-day -day lives for someone to come say, we have a feminist foreign policy. For me, for personally, as karma, this is lovely. It's more pressure on these political groups that are refusing to give uh, women their rights. It's great from where I'm sitting. But practically for you, I think it may be a challenge. Uh, I want to, to, to just quickly give a, an example. There is a, a foundation, an inter international foundation in Geneva called uh, Principles for Peace that recently did global consultations. And I think the German uh, foreign ministry is, part, is partnering with these global consultations. And they, did, uh, they just released on January 18th the eight principles for peace uh, and, and how we should rethink peace and the peace forward, how we should uh, uh, tackle issues of, of conflict resolution. I made a post about it a couple of days ago. They have come to the conclusion, after many consultations, that the, world, the word pluralism is better accepted because some countries where you have religious groups uh, who are governing may not feel comfortable with that term, but may feel comfortable with another term. Again, this is not my personal opinion. I am all for the feminist agenda, for the feminist foreign policy, and I wish you all the best in implementing this <laughs> for my own sake. <laughs> Ich hoffe, Sie genießen auch alle diesen passionierten Austausch. Herr An I hope that you also enjoy this passionate exchange of ideas. Mr. Annen wanted to say something. Karma, just from my experience, we are negotiating with our partners. We are negotiating bilateral economic cooperation. In the past, we called it development aid. And we are negotiating our priorities every two years. We have many negotiations. And it's not about the partners signing off on our concepts. However, our feminist economic cooperation and development is one focus topic of our minister. And we are negotiating with our partners and also the representatives of government and we are talking about it. I don't want to give you any details. It's not always simple, but actually no partner didn't want to discuss it. So it was put on the table. Of course, the result might not always be the one that I wanted to see in the minutes. However, it also is important that we have the discussion. It's not always a discussion among equal partners. But it is important to also tell our partners that it is important to us that we not only think about the term, but that we also want to implement it in our joint economic cooperation work. It's too early to come up with a conclusion. However, it's not neg too negatively associated. We haven't had made too much negative experience here. All right, time is ticking away. However, I guess that there is one question that might be interesting to everyone. Iran, our foreign minister is proclaiming a feminist foreign policy, but she is also criticized that she is doing so little in the situation where Iranian women are asking for help. Ms. Bart, what are you thinking about it? Yes, the foreign minister, together with Iceland, made sure that the UN Security Council had an extraordinary meeting on the human rights situation and the women's situation in Iran. It was a huge risk. And I don't want to give you any confidential information. However, there were also voices in the Federal Foreign Office asking whether she should be doing that. It could also be go wrong. Uh, it could also go wrong. She is the minister. She pushed through. It didn't go wrong. On the contrary, we found many partners also in the Global South who also thought that we need to focus on that. They said the situation is so horrible so that the UN Security Council has to take action. So this is something which would not have been possible without feminist foreign policy and without this new approach. 
I already told you that there is no panacea changing the situation in Iran completely, but no one else has this panacea. I want to say one sentence. Well, the ambassador Katharina Stasch, who organized this in Geneva, this was a huge success. And she has a political magazine in Hamburg, and she wrote a long article detailing why she is not the right person to do that and why she doesn't have enough experience. And I was so angry about it, and that is why I remember that. And the example that Ms. Barge gave to us shows that this is not true. On the contrary, it's a practical result. And of, to the question, who should take over that office? All right, we will focus on one more crisis and then you can, the audience can ask questions. It's about the war of aggression of Russia and Ukraine. At the beginning, in my video clip, I talked about arms deliveries and it doesn't fit to feminist foreign policy. So how is that compatible? I don't have to justify the decision. We don't want, uh, I don't say that feminist foreign policy is contrary to pacifism. Of course, feminist foreign policy is connected to humanitarian aid. However, we also want to help the people in Ukraine and for that we need arms deliveries. If you just remember the horrible pictures from Bucha and the rapes going on and this horrible war has such a strong impact on women. Women are suffering much more than men. And just imagine an alternative, a government which didn't go for the arms exports or arms deliveries. This would not also not be compatible with fo feminist foreign policy. Thank you so much. I would like to open the discussion so that the audience can ask questions because otherwise we don't have any time left. Are there questions from the audience? Then someone with a microphone will approach you. And the people on the live stream can also ask questions. Ms. Vogt will deal with your questions. What are very specific measures, role models, that, where people say, okay, this is representative of feminist foreign policy? Do you address this question to someone in specific? Well, you were asking about foreign policy, but I will answer that question on behalf of cooperation policies. One example of role model is that we support women in African partner countries to reclaim their right to land because women in agriculture also carry a lot of responsibility. However, they don't have the title to the land. This is often connected to the traditional system. There are also different constellations. And our experience is if this is possible, this will be beneficial to the entire society and the productivity, which is of a high importance to society. There is a lack of resources, there is a lack of knowledge, there is a lack of women's representation. And we can really achieve a lot in this regard. I hope this answer was helpful. I would like to continue with the next question. Do you have an online question? Um, I have a question that Ms. Bart might be able to answer. How can different cultures and ethnic groups can be involved in this new foreign policy approach so that not only Western values are imparted 
and Western traditions. This is a very important point. When it comes to feminist foreign policy, we also need to listen better. We need to act in a more inclusive way. And this is something the unit responsible for cultural topics takes very seriously. So what are the structures on the ground that we can reach out to in order to implement our ideas abroad? But this is nothing that's new. There are many initiatives that the Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation Development has supported, for instance, with religious leaders in Nigeria. For instance, to discuss topics like, like FGM, female genital mutilation. So we need to bring topics onto the agenda. And by doing so, you can have a different approach to such a culture. Just wait for the microphone, and then you can ask your question. Is there one strategy, I think, about women in Afghanistan and the news that we read a few days back saying that they can no longer go to university? What can we do? What can the federal government do? Or what is it doing already? Maybe things that they don't talk about, things that we don't read about in the news, because we cannot condone this. This is unacceptable, what's happening to the women and men. Can you give us hope back? Who wants to start? Well, I mean, the Federal Foreign Office is in the vanguard, but this question cannot be answered in an easy or a simple way. No one is unaffected by the things that are happening there. No one with a heart. The country is going back to where it was in the 1990s. And we hope that the Taliban of today wouldn't push through the same politics that it tried to push through in the past. We're not yet sure where it stands, but there is no agreement within the Taliban. Obviously, the Emir sitting in Kandahar tries to push through his own agenda. So there is no consensus, but it's part of an open debate to ascertain that after 20 years of the Afghanistan mission, and many of my colleagues from my ministry were there, tens of thousands of German soldiers were there, The ministries, the Federal Foreign Office, coined this policy, developed this policy. But we no longer have an embassy on the ground. The armed forces left the country. Different institutions decided to stay there to help the people. But we in Berlin, we can no longer shape the framework, unfortunately. But humanitarian aid is still handed out. It's not linked up to political conditions. So we try to stay there with the work that we do. And we are always looking for those wiggle rooms in which we can help women. And these wiggle rooms still exist. It's very difficult, though. So despite the traumatic situation, we should try to maintain a communication channel. And the federal government has established such a channel with the Taliban. And it has yielded results. We've had good conversations. 
And the message that you shared with us is a message that I would like to share in Kabul, but it is very difficult. We will have to be very consistent. Now it's minus 10 degrees Celsius in Afghanistan. It can go down to minus 30. But we have a responsibility in a good and bad way. So I believe it is irresponsible to leave Afghanistan on its own. Now I would like to pass the question to Karmak Mekti. How can we make sure that the measures reach the recipients and reaches them in the long term? But now, Ms. Bart, maybe you wanted to say something first. Yes, I would like to make a comment or add on what you said before. The big humanitarian institutions are still learning how they should react to this new situation in Afghanistan. Many women were sent home so they can work from home. This is very important. It's also very important to our minister, Baerbock, to make sure that women are still employed, especially when it comes to health-related topics. We need to do that with our partners. Amina Mohammed was there to lead conversations, to hold conversations, to find out how we can deal with this situation. But we do not know how the Taliban reacts to pressure. They don't react well to pressure, I must say. It sounds like a contradiction, but we are seeing rather more modest, advanced, or modern Taliban soldiers, but they are not the ones in power, I must say. Hopefully, we will reach a situation where we can continue to work with women. Now, the question to you, there are so many unstable political systems, but they should be the recipients of this policy. So how can we make sure that they do receive our aid and support in the long term? Um, this, this policy is not going to change the world overnight. Um, I'm very aware of that uh, because I, again, I come back and give an example from my own country. I teach at the university and students who are 20-year-olds, you know, high on adrenaline, want to see change, um, they ask me, uh, Professor, do you have hope? Do you have hope? And I tell them, well, I have hope, but my time frame for hope is 50 years. If your time frame for hope is two months, then uh, we have a different understanding of hope and a different understanding of change. And I've reconciled with the idea that the, the change that I'm trying to achieve may come after I die. I, I've, rec I've accepted that idea. I've accepted that I work in a field where I don't own a shop, that I go home at night, I open an Excel sheet, and ah, today I made 500 euros. Oh, today I lost 300 euros. I can't measure that work, right? We can't measure the type of work that we do like that. Uh, we put the framework, we put the policies, we work towards that goal, and we hope that with time, that will happen. And I believe this is a perfect example, the feminist foreign policy. And again, I'm saying this from the receiving end. For me, to see that this term, this policy, this strategy has, is happening is, is a big deal. Uh, 10 years ago, we didn't talk about this. We didn't even have this debate. Uh, 10 years ago, in my country, uh, there was no, you know, knowledge about women, peace, and security agenda. Uh, there were no, uh, 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 you know, uh, 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 politicians wouldn't be afraid every time, you know, uh, 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 someone tells them, look, uh, there's the CV for a woman for minister, you know, they wouldn't consider it before. Now it's like, oh, please get me a CV for a woman because I have the German ambassador coming and he's going to ask me about this women representation and I need the money, so I need to tell him that we're working on. So this debate would not happen before, 
right? It would not happen 10 years ago. Uh, uh, and, and, and this, for me, is a sign of optimism. But one last thought I want to say is to go back to, the, to what I said about security and how it's tied to foreign policy. Does anyone have numbers on how much of the global defense industry is privately owned and how much of it is government owned? And here I put this question on the table because when I talk about building alliances, the private sector has a big role to play in making this whole thing work. We need to speak to the private sector because they have interests in militarization. They have interests in the weapon industry. They have interests in all that we are talking about. And so how can we have them as partners in the next decade, I think, is crucial for us, at least in the receiving end, to, to feel things differently. Vielen Dank. Ich hoffe, niemand ist nervös. We do have some time because we started later, so we do have a bit more time for questions from the audience. I have an online question. Maybe I could bundle the question that I received online. We have questions pertaining to the topic of binarity, so gender identity. And this goes back to the D in the 3R plus D discussion that we had at the beginning. D stands for diversity, but what does it mean? What's the diversity in feminist foreign policy? And uh, Kama Ekmekshi, you just talked about the efficacy. You mentioned the 50 years time frame. Maybe the German panelists would like to react to what you said. How can this be measured? And how can this be evaluated? Who wants to start? And please try to keep it short. Time is of the essence. I don't want anyone to run outside. Well, the question of diversity is a question that we need to ask ourselves in the Federal Foreign Office. How diverse is Germany? How diverse are we along all levels? How successful are we in taking away those obstacles that makes it so difficult for people to have a career? People with a migration background are absolutely underrepresented, at least in the Federal Foreign Office. Even though I believe we've always been a friendly place. where we try to be considerate of everyone. So couples being allowed to work at the Federal Foreign Office, but sometimes we couldn't allow for that to happen because of security reasons. But still, so many things need to change. Or questions like, are you a German diplomat? You don't look German. So. The discussion is being held, and we do conduct this discussion quite vehemently, I must say. Well, the question of efficacy, and you asked me to keep it short, so I try my best. Especially when it comes to humanitarian aid, we have strict factors as to the evaluation of our projects. Every project needs to be evaluated. And we also define the efficacy of the measures that we use. And we want to increase the efficacy when it comes to gender equality. So we will go through the different measures, do our internal evaluations. We also have the Association of International Cooperation, or we have the KFW, Germany's Development Bank. So it's 
difficult for me to give you any serious numbers now because we've had this focal point for half a year now. But I believe that towards the end of this term we will know much better which projects worked very well and where we have to fine tune the projects. It will be a long term process. And the German Bundestag, they give us the money, they really take a very close look at that. And we get many questions from the members of parliament and we need to answer their questions thoroughly. And if you want to know more about that, you can go to the DEVAL website. There you find much more detailed information also coming from the GIZ, the Institution of International Cooperation. I believe there was still one part that Karma Ekmekci could answer, right? Now Elisa Fox's comment is of Mike, but it was something about diversity. The comment is of Mike, but I, the interpreter cannot understand the question. Questions I have here online. Um, uh, sorry, give me one second. Um, question. The Diplomen podcast <laughs> is actually uh, supported by UN Women, but from GI GIZ funds. So thank you very much. <laughs> I believe there was someone in the second row with a question. Yeah, second row. He wanted to ask a question. I do not know how to explain myself, but I believe you should try to put yourself in someone else's shoes. It's nice to have people in the Federal Foreign Office to almost kill each other because they want to have better pensions and a better position. But then you have the Taliban on the other hand, and they want to enforce their own position. The World Championship football was held in Qatar. And there was a discussion about homosexuals. And of course, the Western nations as arrogant as always, tried to push through that homosexuals are accepted. But the Qatari ambassador said, well, there are a couple of homosexuals, but why should we change our 1600 year long tradition for a couple of homosexuals? And what the Americans did in Vietnam, they wreaked havoc there. What cares did they create in Iraq? It was the same situation. Maybe you could come to the question. Okay, my question is quite simple. I believe it's overbearing of us to tell the Qatari people, just as an example, to tell them, let homosexuals go to the game to have them watch the football game. Why can't we just accept the country as it is. It might be said, and personally, because of my own socializing and my social background, you need to come to the point, I'm sorry. No, please don't interrupt me. This is very important. Why are we that overbearing? Why do we want to dictate to the world what kind of morals we should pursue? Okay, thank you so much. Ms. Bart, do you want to comment? Well, in the case of Qatar, there are lesbians and gays, not just in Germany, not just in Europe. And we do discuss topics like these. There are commitments, obligations coming from international law, like the Universal Charter on Human Rights, and it clearly stipulates what we can expect of countries, what we can expect of governments. 
and what they need to transpose into national law. But you're right when you say that we should not dictate, we should not lecture them. We do not want to be lectured either. We've seen this ourselves during the last few weeks, but an honest debate. I mean, the rights of gays and lesbians, governments can talk about that with other governments, like we do with capital punishment, or equal rights for men and women, or no torture. Very basic things that we can discuss with governments. Now, the comment is off mic. We do not have time to go into detail, I'm sorry, is what Ms. Popper just said. I'm sorry, we don't have the time. The comment is off mic. The interpreter cannot hear what is said without a microphone. Okay, we do not have time to go into detail. Let's try to wrap it up. Oh yes, we can go outside later on. There is a reception and we can discuss the details. Now I would like to give the three panelists one last chance to tell us what they expect of a feminist foreign policy in three years' time. It's difficult to answer that question. However, considering our objectives, and we now have one year of experience in the Federal Foreign Office and the Ministry of Economic Cooperation and Development, we want to promote specific policy measures. We want to stick to our objectives. We want to work on that. And we need to have the support in Germany. So right now, this is a good opportunity to explain what we are doing, because our partners also realize what we're doing and whether we get the support or whether we don't get any support from Germany. So everything is interconnected. It's not about the question whether we want to dictate things or lecture other nations. We don't want to intervene and dictate a different government model to other regions. However, it is a general question of justice. And that is why I think we need to promote this policy. And what I'm concerned about is that there are some countries, which were mentioned here, that are promoting feminist foreign policy, and they also provide resources to that end, also in difficult times. But also in developed countries, in Western-style countries, we still see that women's rights are being curtailed right now. There is a debate about abortions in the United States. There are debates in Europe. And it's not just about the dialogue with our partner countries, but it is also about a credible stance. We have to have a critical dialogue in your own country and in your own groups. That's quite shocking, but that's also part of our reality right now. Ms. Bart, the same question, and Ms. Ekmekci, I have, actually have a different question to you, but first Ms. Bart. I think we will be quite successful in the mainstreaming, the English term again, so I don't think that there will be a box that can be checked. Oh, they do feminist problem policy, check. We actually have to develop a human rights and feminist reflex in everything we do in the Federal Foreign Office. So in three or five years' time, I think it's important that the foreign representations which cooperate with us and which are visible to the outside world reflect this. Germany is perceived through our foreign representations abroad. And we need to have discussions in those countries with 
um, gay and lesbian associations, with women associations. We need to promote civil society in these countries. So the role of the civil society sometimes is being curtailed, and that is why it's such an important task. Our Federal Foreign Office needs to report on women and marginalized groups, and we should not only talk to the foreign ministry or the government. So we need to go into society to make a change. And what the State Secretary already said is something that I share. I share this concern. There are also European partners with which it is very difficult to discuss maybe not equal rights of women, but they say, well, gender, this term should not be used in a European declaration because there are only women, men and women. And there is a number of states with which we have these difficult discussions in Brussels. And sometimes we don't have any agreements on human rights because you continue to have discussions about these terms gender, for instance, and this is weakening the entire system. It's weakening Europe. It's weakening us as Germany. Because it costs a lot of energy to have these discussions. And of course, there is this controversial discussion going on, and others perceive that. One final question to Ms. Ekmekci. You are our international perspective. Can Germany be a role model for other countries in terms of feminist foreign policy? <laughs> what do you want me to say? I'm in Germany, so of course. <laughs> no, but to be, to be I mean, uh, uh, of course, I, I mean it with all my heart. But I want to point out something that happened, and you mentioned it in your video, I believe. Sweden was the country that started this for, feminist foreign policy back in 2014. They developed this beautifully, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, highly detailed Swedish feminist foreign, foreign policy handbook. Uh, I'm sure you've all read it if you <laughs> wanted to, to have one of your own. Uh, uh, and and to, to have this feminist foreign policy, it's twofold. You have to look internally, I know it's called foreign policy, but it looks internally into your institutions that deal with the outside world, so how you can be more inclusive, how you can be you know, a, a more equal and have the rights of your diplomat in the foreign ministry you know, and all that, and how you look outwards. And, and, and Sweden did a very good job, right? But what happened a few months ago? Elections, right government, let's throw this in the bin. My worry is that maybe this government is interested in a feminist foreign policy, but who knows what will happen in the future. So what, what should be, in my view, um, why I think Germany can be a model is because we have precedents and we can learn from what happened in Sweden or in an, another country. Now, Spain also, by the way, has a feminist foreign policy. How that is going and how you can learn from these mistakes so that we don't get excited and then, bam, three years later, you know, something changes in Germany and this policy is changed. So how can this be in institutionalized? Uh, I know your, uh, your chancellor has this new term, this Titan vendor, even in Lebanon we say it now, you know, like this paradigm shift um, of uh, maybe it should be included in that, you know, somehow and, and you know, uh, 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 baked into the DNA of the country because my worry is that someone else will come and change it. So maybe we can learn from the other countries and, um, and I, I wish you all the best in what you're doing because really I, I, I'm, I'm very honored to, to be sitting here with you and you're doing this uh, great job. So, yeah, yeah, and damit sind wir Thanks so much. And that's the end of tonight's event. This was a very passionate debate. Thank you very much to Niels Annen, Helga Bart, and Karma Ekmekci. I would also like to thank the great team at the Kerber Foundation for making this event possible. Thank you for the organization. I would also like to thank the interpreters. 
And I would also like to thank you, dear audience. Thank you here in this room and also at home in front of the screens. I looked around and I saw many faces that seem to be very interested in what we were saying. If you missed any part of the talk or would like to recommend it to friends and acquaintances, it will be available in the Media Library and the Körper Foundation website. And you can also find the discussion on YouTube. And before you leave this room, I would like to point towards a series of events here at the Kerber Forum, which is called Female Futures on February the 8th. The Invisible Patient. This is about the drastic consequences of the underrepresentation of women in health research. And on the 8th of March, we have another panel discussion on the way to equality. On International Women's Day, the focus is on different visions for an equal society. And of course, you can continue the discussions outside. Bye-bye.